Good afternoon, and thanks to all for joining us for this update. Indianapolis saw a very different Memorial Day weekend uh, this year. In addition to altering our daily lives, the COVID-19 pandemic has altered our most beloved annual traditions. On Memorial Day, I often think of a quote from uh, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, who once said, those who have long enjoyed such privileges as we enjoy, forget in time that men and women have died to win them. That's the significance of Memorial Day. In a word, sacrifice. And while we noted the void left where our race weekend would have been, we also honored the void left by the brave men and women who gave their lives so that others might live. What many don't realize is that this famous quote from President Roosevelt was not delivered in a speech. It was part of a presidential proclamation honoring the adoption of our Bill of Rights. In his proclamation, President Roosevelt challenged the country to engage in the remembrance of the democratic and peaceful action by which these rights were gained and to set aside a day of reassessment of their present meaning and their living worth. On Memorial Day, we honor the sacrifice that promotes liberty. So before we get into today's announcement, I wanna take a moment to recognize something. The tension that exists between those two ideals, sacrifice and liberty. And that tension has never been more apparent. But today, as we take another small step toward our city's return to normalcy. I want to acknowledge that amidst all of this uncertainty, I am confident that the history books will remember this time as a time in which our city came together to sacrifice for the common good. I'm also confident that our commitment to a data-driven public health policy has saved lives. For that reason, we will be taking another step forward in Marion County, implementing many of the aspects of stage three of the back on track plan. Effective Friday, May 29, houses of worship can resume indoor service at 50% capacity providing congregants engage in social distancing and wear face coverings. And there will be no cap on outdoor services that are socially distanced. That is effective May 29. I'll name a few more policies and then let Dr. Virginia Kane get into the specifics. Effective June 1, the cap on public gatherings will be increased to 50 individuals. Restaurants may serve indoors and outdoors at 50% of their total capacity, so long as social distancing policies remain in effect and staff wear PPEs. Personal service industries may resume by appointment only with PPE worn by all staff and all patrons. Now, this includes salons, spas, and tattoo parlors. Gyms and fitness centers may open at 50% capacity with social distancing and sanitation requirements. 
tennis courts, basketball courts, and non-contact sports fields may reopen. Pools may reopen at 50% capacity. If these facilities are indoors, face coverings for staff will be mandatory. Additionally, shopping malls and non-essential retail can increase to 75% capacity with the same restrictions around social distancing. In accordance with state guidance, we will not be opening movie theaters, live performance venues, tourism, and cultural events and venues. Bowling alleys, arcades, or bars remain closed. Many more details can be found in the Marion County Public Health Department's forthcoming order. So before I turn it over to my partner, Dr. Virginia Kane, I want to reiterate something that has been said during our previous updates, but it cannot be stressed enough. The very best way you can protect others from COVID-19 is by wearing a face covering while in public. When you see someone with a mask, they aren't wearing it for themselves. They're wearing it for you. It is why from the start, our message has been simple. We are in this together. But only if we commit to protecting one another when we take these first steps back into a daily normal routine. And to those who disagree with the science or the style of wearing masks in public, I have an even simpler message. You're simply wrong. We just had a day reminding us all, reminding us all what true heroism is. This is a small task by comparison. And it is a small ask by comparison. But I also recognize that Masks may be difficult to access. That's why we're kicking off a citywide initiative to ensure that every Indianapolis resident has free, easy access to obtain a mask. This morning, we launched indy.gov slash masks. That's indy.gov slash masks, where you can request washable, reusable masks for you and for your family. It is our hope to begin delivering them within the next 30 days. We will soon be announcing community partnerships that will include pickup locations throughout and across our city. We've earned these steps to reopen, but now we must do our part to keep Indianapolis open. So get a mask and wear a mask. This Memorial Day weekend, we were given a stark reminder of why we take these precautions. Throughout our city, throughout our state, throughout our nation, our nation's flag flew at half staff to memorialize an unprecedented 100,000 Americans who have lost their lives to COVID-19. That is a staggering number, especially considering all the precautions we've taken. But there is reason to hope and working together, we will get through this. We will get through this. As always, I'm joined today by Dr. Virginia Kane, Director of the Marion County Department of uh, Public Health, and I am pleased to hand it over to her for her perspectives and more information. Dr. Kane. Thank you, Mayor Hotstead, and let me just say again uh, that, you know, um, this COVID um, disease outbreak 
will continue to remain in our communities unless we are responsible stewards. And I just want to applaud you again, your team and your staff and your leadership in helping to keep Indianapolis uh, safe. And I just want to highlight just a few numbers in terms of where we are in regard to this outbreak. So in order to really have a safe summer, next slide. In order to have a safe summer, a one second here, I'm having a little technical difficulties for me to see the screen. Dr. Kane, I think you're muted. So if you can unmute yourself. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Okay, great. Sorry. Yes, about Dr. That. Kane. Okay. Not a problem. Thank you. Okay. So, when we look at Marion County, we have roughly 9,628 cases of the uh, entire state of Indiana. That represents roughly one third of all the COVID 19 cases. We have reached a point. 539 deaths, and we have really expanded our testing just in the last weeks where we've tested now 50,000 of our residents. If we wanted to see how we track in the, in the uh, United States and the progress we're making as states, this map highlights those states that are making progress to the new norm. And if you will see here, those states that are highlighted red are trending very poorly in regard to numbers. But when you look at uh, Indiana and its surrounding states, in the states in the yellow, you will see that we're making a significant progress based on criteria that has been set up uh, uh, from the national mm -hmm. government. And the only states that have trended significantly doing extremely well are, is New York and New Mexico. Next slide. So it's been a tough issue trying to assure the health and well being of the residents in uh, Marion County, but at the same time, trying to balance that very hard the economic hardships that are going through different families and the businesses related to our phased approach. So just remind everyone, uh, we have different benchmarks that we look in terms of whether we're making significant progress. And that is, have we seen a reduction in our community transmission for the last 14 days? Are our hospitals and long-term care facilities able to meet any emergency surge of care uh, if we should see a, 
a peak in our cases and then our ability to provide sufficient testing and do contact tracing in terms of monitoring our cases. So one of the things we look at, we look at our decrease in our emergency room visits. We looked at our decrease in our hospitalizations, looking at our death rates and whether the percent of the people that we're testing, what percentage of them are positive and is that, are those numbers going down lower? So this slide highlights that from April the 1st through May the 22nd, looking at our emergency room visits, and these are just residents and patients who have COVID-19 symptoms only, no influenza, you can see that we continue to have a downward trend through May the 20th. When we look at our new cases for COVID-19, you're gonna see an increase of cases with expanded testing. And as you see around the, uh, when we start to see our rise, uh, the last week in April, May the, uh, April the 29th, where we saw a huge peak going up and into our first week in May, but you now see the gradual decrease in our number of cases so that right now we seem to be roughly under the 150 cases a day mark, whereas two weeks ago, we were averaging over 200 cases a day. So significant reduction in our cases. When we look at our hospital admission, which is really critical, you will see that our hospital admissions have significantly decreased since early April uh, in terms of the uh, patients who were positive for our hospital admission. Now, when we also look at our deaths, when we saw our largest number of cases in that um, last week of April, first week of May, we are starting to see a significant reduction in the number of deaths that have, have occurred since that period of time. Next slide. Uh, but probably one of the most important factors that we monitor is that we're continuing to see a decrease in the number of people that we tested turning out to have a positive COVID-19 test. So that continues to be on the decline. Do we have sufficient capacity? Uh, currently right now for all of our medical and surgical beds, we're, we're at a 88% occupancy. So our hospitals and our healthcare systems appear to be well equipped to handle any potential surge that may occur as we're going through our reopening phase. So the most other and final critical component that we really need to continue to push is really having the ability for our community to be able to test people who have COVID-19 symptoms. We've had a number of enormous partners out there who have expanded uh, our testing. And uh, we've got some new partners out there that we started last week. We wanna thank Warren Central High School uh, for a new site last week, as well as the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, who's allowed us to have another site and our Indianapolis Medical Society and Escalapian Medical Society, who have continued to be new partners supporting this new endeavor, uh, besides uh, Kroger's uh, really coming out front and providing additional testing and Walmart, Walmart has also provided uh, three additional um, uh, uh, sites for testing and the Indiana State Department of Health continues to add new sites uh, for testing. So we are feeling pretty good that we're gonna be meeting our benchmarks for the ability to test people who have COVID-19 symptoms, especially for our vulnerable uh, populations, as well as continuing to conduct active case monitoring and contact tracing. So as the mayor has emphasized uh, and following along with the governor's um, uh, mandate and following his recommendations, 
We've moved into phase three, and we're now able to open our retail and malls at 75% capacity with social distancing. With the mall's common area limited to 50% capacity, uh, salons, spas, tattoo parlors may be open by appointment only, but clearly you must recognize that not only the employees and patrons, both are required to wear face coverings, both, not just the employee staff, but the patrons as well. Our restaurants can now open indoor seating as long as it's split between any indoor and outdoor seating at 50% capacity. I'm, uh, uh, um, it's so important that our uh, religious services may now be able to resume at 50% capacity uh, where uh, any participant ends within the church is mandatory to wear face coverings for indoor services unless the, you have a little uh, child that's two years and under, no master required, but outdoor services can be held with no capacity limit. Gyms and fitness centers may open at 50% capacity. Uh, you may have some additional recommendations such that your equipment must be at least 10 feet apart when um, uh, providing personal services to clients in your facilities, but no contact sports are allowed. Basketball, tennis courts, uh, sports fields, uh, swimming pools, can open at 50% capacity. And please, practice and conditioning may resume, but for only non-contact sports only. Uh, it is so important for people to be able to get back to work, and we are um, uh, would like to open up daycare facilities. Summer day camps can occur, but no overnight camp is allowed but YMCA programs, adult day service programs can open with social distancing. Campgrounds may open, but any on-site playground facilities must remain closed. And then lastly, raceways may open uh, currently, but no spectators are allowed at this time. And lastly, uh, really critical, non-essential manufacturing and industrial facilities will also be able to be open as long as social distancing and face coverings are, uh, are uh, initiated. And so with that, um, let me just say, uh, and I will reemphasize what the uh, mayor had said has stated, that the ability for us to get to our new normal, to, to bring this vibrant city and continue to emphasize um, how wonderful city it is for our community, that we really want to encourage everyone, please wear a face covering while in public. Continue to do your personal um, things that you can do in order to protect yourself and your loved ones with frequent hand washing, maintain that six feet distance between yourself and others, and really try to encourage social distancing practices uh, among your colleagues, your friends, and family members. Public gatherings are limited to 50 people or fewer, but high-risk individuals, uh, if you're immunocompromised, if you have some, any age, uh, significant medical underlying conditions, and those over the age of 65, we really would like for you uh, to encourage you to stay at home as much as possible. And businesses out there continue to do remote working as much as possible um, in order to continue your business endeavor. It's only if we're able to continue to be vigilant, even with these ease restrictions, we will be hitting a home run. And so I just uh, want to thank again, uh, Mayor Hasek for your leadership, 
I want to thank all of our partners uh, as we are um, uh, pushing to do contact tracing uh, with the city, uh, Fairbanks School of Public Health, and the Indiana State Department of Health and my epidemiology and um, infectious disease, communicable disease team at our health department. We have a significant number of partners, different agencies that will continue to help us. And so stay safe out there, okay? And do the right thing. Be patriotic. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Dr. Kane. We will open it up to questions. Uh, if you enter your name and outlet in the Q&A box, we will call on you and unmute your microphone in order to allow you to answer your question. First one up for the second time today is Russ McQuaid from Fox 59. And good morning, uh, Dr. Kane. Yesterday, the CDC came out and said antibody testing at best is perhaps 50% accurate. I'm wondering what is the public health department's reliance on antibody tracing results to uh, track the positivity rate in Marion County? So, Russ, let me just say that um, um, for us, it's more critical and important for, for us to know whether I have an active infection versus um, I'm able to determine whether I ever had COVID testing back in, say, January or February. Because these tests are, are not as at the level of accuracy that we like, our health department is continuing to use testing for the actual virus antigen itself where we're concentrating because I really need to know where our active infection is. I'm less concerned about past infections so that I can really concentrate on contact tracing, trying to identify the last 14 days of that person's interactions with other people where they may have spread infections. So right now we're just focusing on active antigen or viral particle detection as opposed to antibody testing. Eric Berman, WIBC. Have it now. There you go. Yeah. I really need to change the mouse click rate. Uh, Mr. Mayor, good morning. Um, good morning. Question and a clarification. Uh, this diverges slightly from the state order in terms of the cap, the cap on mass gatherings being at just 50 instead of 100. You're also not going quite as far as the state on uh, houses of worship. What's the rationale for keeping those lower limits in place? And the clarification, um, did I understand Dr. Kane to say that conditioning drills are not allowed for contact sports, not just contact sports, but the conditioning drills for them? So who's going first, Mayor, you are? Go ahead, Doctor. So for the contact sports, you can do conditioning, but let's, let's just say you play football and I've, you know, you're out there and, and just so you know, I was a former football player uh, in the undergraduate school. You cannot, uh, in your practicing and your drills, you can't tackle another individual where you have physical contact. But you know how you can have practice. As long as you do your practices and your drills and you're not touching another player, that's fine from a conditioning standpoint. Ladies can be very brutal when they play contact sports, just so you may know. And Eric, I just simply add regarding the first part of your question, uh, what is driving uh, Marion County uh, and our uh, now uh, opening up to the, the beginning of uh, stage three uh, is as uh, Dr. Kane has uh, analyzed in detail in her presentation, and that is uh, we still in Marion County, as, as, as well as we are doing, as, as good as everybody is uh, responding, to the requests that we are making. Uh, we still, as a percentage, have 30% uh, of the total number of presumptive positive uh, uh, coronavirus diagnosis. 30% uh, of the 
of the overall overall state number. And we're a little under 30% now, uh, but uh, just barely under 30% uh, of the total number of tragic COVID-19 related deaths. And Eric, when you consider that the total population of the city of Indianapolis is approximately 12 to 13% of the total population of the state of Indiana, and yet we're experiencing 30%, of the presumptive positive cases and the COVID-19 related deaths. Um, I think in no small measure, and I don't mean to speak for uh, Dr. Kane and her public health staff, but from my perspective, um, Indianapolis is uh, moving forward cautiously, appropriately, responsibly, uh, given how disproportionately affected the city of Indianapolis has been by the COVID uh, 19 uh, pandemic. Dr. Kane, you wanna add so I just I just wanna add that when you look at uh, Marion County compared to the rest of the state, we just have a much higher population density. So because of our higher population density, it makes it easier for our risk for spreading contagious diseases much greater than if you look at the state of Indiana as a whole. And so just with an abundance of caution, we want to really get a feel for how well we're doing as we're reopening up uh, Marion County to our different business and other civic um, endeavors where we can watch this very closely. And it takes about three to four weeks for you to see your impact. And, and even if we see some rises in our cases, we want those rises to be so low that we don't have to, we shut down everything where we can handle a little mal uh, rising cases and that's fine. And that may be even a, a slight expectation for a large metropolitan city, but we don't want to go backwards. And so just an abundance of caution, we want this to sort of be a little gradual phase because we're different, we're unique than most any other cities in the state of Indiana. Abdul Hakeem Shabazz in politics. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, can you hear me? Yes, we can, yeah. Abdul. All right, great. Uh, uh, my question was uh, two things. Uh, number one, what was the logic behind closing that uh, Monument Circle. Uh, I could see you know, Illinois Street uh, with the restaurants, but Monument Circle, there's had a lot of people confused as to why was that? Well, even though DPW has said it'll reopen. And number two, uh, when do bars get to reopen in Marion County? Because I know there's a lot of concern about folks on one side of Raceway Drive or 96th Street can't open, but the places across the street in Henderson County actually can. Yeah, I. Uh... As it relates to uh, question one, uh, we are making an adjustment on Monument Circle um, because of traffic related uh, issues that came up over the course of the, the last weekend. Uh, and, and this was a request made of us by Downtown Indy. So we're trying to be as responsive to not only patrons who access uh, Monument Circle, uh, the retail uh, outlets that inhabit Monument Circle, but also traffic patterns and and uh, and requests from our uh, stakeholders and partners, uh, and in this case, it was uh, downtown Indy. Um, as to the second question, you want to repeat it, Abdul? When do bars? Uh, sure. When do bars get to uh, reopen? Because uh, I've been heard some concern about bars on say south of 96th Street or one side of Raceway Drive. Are closed, but across the street, they're open. Yeah, I think uh, the the simple answer to your question, uh, Abdul, is bar reopening is is if I carried in my recollection a stage four or a phase four uh, issue. And today we're announcing essentially that Marion County is attempting to very cautiously and responsibly enter stage. Three. Anything in addition, uh, doctor? No, that's correct. So based on the uh, governor's back to uh, 
Indiana uh, track. Uh, stage three, all bars and nightclubs are closed for stage three. So um, we're not allowed to be less strict than the governor's uh, recommendations and guidelines. Dr. Kane, it might be helpful if you could uh, explain the uh, aerosolized nature of the virus and why sometimes bars might be at this moment a dangerous place for us to reopen so quickly. So, so one of the, the one of the issues with the the bars is, is that um, you, based on people speaking and talking and interaction, um, you may have a higher quantity of respiratory droplets in in a enclosed environment with the bars. And so as a result of that, they're considered at a much higher risk based on their contact density of contagious respiratory droplets interacting with other individuals. And based on that science and that evidence, uh, most um, governmental uh, entities are having those particular businesses uh, be sort of at the, the last part of the phase in terms of reopening for the community in terms of proximity and the amount of the virus to spread in their environment from folks and, who um, are in, interact at a bar. And Dr. Kane, isn't it correct that statewide bars should be closed until state, stage four? Yes, that is correct. So there should not be any bar or nightclub open uh, in the state of Indiana. Great. We have David Williams from Wish TV. Good morning, everyone. Um, across the country, experts are watching and warning about a possible second wave or resurgence as all states begin to reopen now and counties as well. Is Marion County prepared to possibly handle a second wave of coronavirus if uh, we reopen? So, yes, let me just say that we meet on a regular basis with our hospital partners, all of our hospital partners, and we try to meet on a weekly basis. So we're very careful, and the hospital systems and healthcare systems are very careful about um, how many medical and surgical beds they have, how many ventilators, if that's required in order to meet the demand. And so you also have to remember back in uh, uh, February, March, and April, we were having the influenza season going along at the same time we were having the COVID-19. Now that our influenza season um, has dramatically dropped and less significant, that frees up a lot of beds for us, at least going all the way through fall. So we're now in the phase of actually having elective surgeries taking place in our hospital systems, but our hospital partners are being very cautious. They're doing that on a gradual basis to make sure that if we did have a, another significant surge, of cases, we should be well equipped in order to handle any kind of surge from a capacity standpoint. And, and David, I would just simply add to what Dr. Kane has uh, emphasized in her presentation. That is <clears throat> the issue of a resurgence uh, is uh, of paramount importance to all of us. And that is why we are prioritizing uh, more testing, uh, the contact tracing, standing up uh, as best we can, as quickly and as responsibly as we can, uh, and then frankly, working with our partners uh, on uh, new treatment uh, methodologies or protocols. But uh, if you have robust testing and if you have uh, contact tracing, uh, it, is, uh, it is much easier uh, to contain any kind of resurgence that we may experience. So that's why, as Dr. Kane emphasized, uh, you know, the tracing and the, uh, and the testing are critically important. Erica Irish, State House Files. Hello. 
Hi, good afternoon. Hey, good afternoon, Mayor and Dr. Kane. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit more about the uh, mask initiative. Um, what costs are attached to that and from where is the city obtaining the supply of masks? Yeah, in terms of the cost, Erica, it, it cost is, is unknown uh, at this point uh, in no small measure because we don't know what the nature uh, and the volume of the requests will be. Uh, I would not be surprised if it was in the uh, area of a, perhaps a million dollars. Uh, as to where we're obtaining the masks, I want to default to Paul Babcock and, uh, and he can provide uh, elucidation there. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so, Erica, we're for, uh, getting the mask from a U.S.-based supplier. Um, that hasn't been finalized exactly, so I would be remiss to give you the information of exactly where, and then it changes over the next, you know, 48 hours, just because of trying to negotiate the best price for the city, as well as making sure we get access to the mask in a way that we can supply the volume to our residents here in Marion County. Wonderful. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we'll be following up with a press release and uh, documentation later this afternoon. Thank you.